Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Isham, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. The NCC WSE's Climate Change Science and Management webinar series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptation and aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on fish and wildlife. I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, uh, Dr. David Bo Bonell, and he will be presenting predicted climate change effects on fisheries habitat and product, uh, production uh, in the Great Lakes. Bo has been a research fishery biologist at the U.S. Great Lakes Center, uh, Science Center for the past nine years. His research focuses on trying to understand the mechanisms underlying the dynamics of prey fishes in the Great Lakes, with a, a particular emphasis on the interactions with invasive species, zooplankton, and climate change. He received his BS in biology from the Center College of, in Danville, Kentucky, his MS from Clemson University, and his PhD from Ohio State University. Bo, welcome. Thank you, Ashley. So today we're going to try to make some linkages between climate change and fisheries habitat in the Great Lakes. And I just want to say from the start that I am really just a spokesperson of a, a lot of really smart people's projects uh, that we have melded together for one sort of synthesis that I'll present today. And those include Chuck Mendengen and David Warner from USGS, Brent Lofgren, Marjorie Perrault from Noah Glarell, Paris Collingsworth, Yu Chun Kao from the University of Michigan, Randy Claremont from Michigan Department of Natural Resources, Carlo DeMarchi from Case Western Reserve University, and Michael Murray from the National Wildlife Federation. And you'll see these names come up as we sort of move through the, the, high, or the outline of this talk. Starting from the global scale, many of you are probably familiar with the projections that, um, that, are, are, that, that have been forecast. And as you look at the latest forecast from the IPC, IPCC, you see a couple of obvious trends. The first is that um, the projections for increases in surface temperature are much greater over land than they are over water. And then the increases actually are, are greater um, as you move away from the equator. So when we think about large uh, systems, freshwater systems that uh, occur on land, especially at northern climates, you can imagine they could be uh, disproportionately impacted by changes in climate. And as we look at the research that has been done to date, mostly looking backwards over the past 50 years or so in these large, deep freshwater lakes, there have been a few con uh, sort of consistent changes. First of all, sort of increases in water temperature, especially in surface waters, uh, an increase in thermal stability, and reductions in ice cover. Um, However, as we look to biological responses or even changes in chemistry, the consistency has not really um, been as apparent uh, so far. Just to give you an example of some of those changes um, in a few of these particular systems, one is Lake Baikal um, in Siberia. And you can see, and this is a nice synthesis paper done by Moore et al. in 2009 showing reductions in ice duration since World War II or so, so that today there's about 18 days longer without ice. Also increases in mean annual water temperature, uh, about 2 degrees C. As we move to the Laurentian Great Lakes, uh, focusing on some work done in Lake Superior, which is the largest, deepest, and northernmost of our Great Lakes. Uh, and if we look at the effect of ice cover on other measures of uh, the physical environment, um, from 1979 to 2006, you can see essentially that um, when you have less ice on this side of the uh, relationship, you get an earlier stratification period and you get warmer uh, water temperatures for different basins of, of the lake. Um, so just to give you a sense of, of some of how, how some of these physical parameters have changed through time and how we might expect them to change in the future uh, through a warming climate. So for those that aren't familiar with uh, our study region, the Laurentian Great Lakes and its watershed highlighted here in brown is home to more than 30 million U.S. and Canadian citizens. 
Um, it contains about 20% of the world's surface fresh water, and that in turn provides drinking water to tens of millions. It has 17,000 kilometers of shoreline, so to put that in perspective, that, um, that would uh, wrap about halfway around the, the world's equator. And on those uh, shorelines are numerous recreational activities, as indicated by uh, this beach uh, photograph from northern Lake Michigan. And in, when we bring it down to fisheries, they are a, a key economic driver within our region. Directly, they spend about, anglers spend about $2.5 billion in our year, uh, in our most recent year of data. And the multipli multiplicative impact of that is about $7 billion. So uh, a, a key aspect of our economy and also, of course, in the ecology of the Great Lakes. So for our research, we really tried to take a mechanistic approach to try to take uh, climate, sort of atmospheric um, climate, and, and take that down to a level here on, on your right side, an effect on fisheries management. And to do that, we looked for ways in which climate effects could have an influence on fisheries. So for a, a fairly simple example, uh, we might expect less ice cover in the future. Uh, there have been previous papers that have shown uh, a, a linkage between ice cover for species such as Lake Whitefish. It's a valuable commercial fishery in the Great Lakes, um, which uh, over, have their eggs overwintering uh, under the ice. And in years in which you have less ice cover to protect those eggs, you tend to get uh, fewer recruits or fewer number of, uh, of those eggs that ultimately survive and, and make it to be in the fishery. Uh, we can think about multiple climate-driven effects, and just for the sake of time, I'm not going to walk you through this, but again, the general idea, and I'll, as will be illustrated throughout the talk, is we can think about measures of climate, think about how those may be mechanistically influencing fish, and, and then uh, and ultimately how that may impact uh, fishery management decisions. Excuse me, Bo? <clears throat> yes. Could you please speak up or uh, move a little bit closer to the phone? We have some participants that are having difficulty hearing you. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, so our our overall conceptual framework then tries to uh, take identify, the, sort of uh, take into account this mechanistic approach. And to do that, we've sort of laid out uh, a couple of different uh, scenarios. First is a retrospective analysis where we use historical data to try to detect climate signals on biotic variables. And then secondly, we've uh, shifted to forecasting. So looking forward, can we develop localized climate predict predictions for the Great Lakes region and um, take those forecasts and hope and try to, um, and first of all, where we find climate signals in our historical data, try to forecast that response for, from say a fish in terms of its growth or its recruitment. Or secondly, where we have previously uh, un previous understanding of climate impacts on biota, we can apply that previous understanding to forecast the particular effect. Is that any better in terms of sound? Um, Doug or Mark, can you hear them? Can you hear Bo better? You can just text chat it in. Yeah, because I'm not seeing the text chat, so. Yep, that's fine. And okay. I can hear you a lot better. Thank you. All right. I'm just speaking louder then. Um, so that really then sets the outline for today's talk. We'll, we'll have really four mini talks. The first two are sort of retrospective analyses looking for climate signals. Uh, we'll then move into the forecasting component, first of all, here in number three, where we provide some downscale climate forecasts, and then fourth, some, downscale, some forecasts for how uh, growth of, of particular fish species could be affected by these climate re, um, regimes. So first is uh, a discussion or, or, or an analysis of uh, primary, uh, primary production in chlorophyll A. And this work was led by uh, David Warner from USGS, USGS and Barry Lesht. Dave is pictured here with his family. And the idea was to try to detect um, to what extent climate uh, nutrients and dracaenid mussels are influencing primary production in the Great Lakes. So why is it important, or why do we care about lake productivity? Well, again, at the global scale, there's been tremendous changes in lake trophic status over the past 50 years. Some lakes, like Lake Victoria, have been increasing in productivity. 
uh, eutrophication, as we say. Other lakes, like the Laurentian Great Lakes, have actually been undergoing uh, an oligotrophication, a reduction in nutrients to the system. And this productivity affects ecosystem services, such as uh, drinking water, uh, recreational opportunities. You don't want to swim where you can't see your toes, for example. And then ultimately production of harvestable fish, with the linkage being phytoplankton supporting uh, zooplankton, which in turn supports baby fish and ultimately the survival uh, up to older fish. And we can think about this phytoplankton production or, or chlorophyll A, which is a surrogate for phytoplankton production, uh, in a couple of different ways. The first is one as a measure of timing. So ideally, uh, or typically what limnologists and ecologists see are these sort of peak, these different uh, modes in terms of peaks of biomass where phytoplankton tend to bloom first, followed by zooplankton and fish larvae. And since the days of Hjort back in the early 20th century, um, managers and well, ecologists have been aware of some overlap necessary between larval fish and zooplankton. And so one concern about climate change is that you could get differential responses. Let's say in a less than ideal situation, you have earlier blooms of phytoplankton and the zooplankton and fish may not respond in the same way. So you could end up with starvation of larvae uh, or starvation of zooplankton. The second component uh, beyond timing is magnitude. And um, this is another fairly simple concept just illustrated here where essentially the base of the food web is primary production, is that algae that is produced fixed, uh, fixed carbon from the sun. Um, and ultimately, as you move up each trophic level, we see a trophic efficiency rate of about 10% on average. So um, as you widen the width of primary production or you narrow it, ultimately you're going to have consequences on the fish and the zooplankton that are, are dependent upon that primary production. So now moving to the Great Lakes then, uh, both, both Lakes Michigan and Huron, where Dave's work uh, was located, uh, there's a couple of, there, this just gives you a sense of that oligotrophication that's been occurring. We see declines in total phosphorus loading into the Great Lakes, and this is a result of legislation back in the year 1973 between the United States and Canada, which limited phosphorus um, being put into uh, washing machine detergents. And we've seen with that a concomitant decline slowly in, um, in total phosphorus measured in the spring. Now, that phosphorus has been accelerated since the late 1990s. The decline in phosphorus, rather, has been accelerated. And that is largely attributed to the proliferation of an, of an invasive species called the quagga mussels. So the Great Lakes first had the zebra mussel uh, um, invasion, which is which was well publicized, but now it's almost all quagga mussels. And we can see here by this graph um, where chlorophyll A is measured in the summer. So this is the time when um, actually um, quagga mussels that live on the bottom of the lake should not have uh, access to the entire water column because during the summer, of course, the lakes are stratified. You have a warmer epilimnetic layer on top, a colder hypolimnetic layer, and um, essentially uh, mussels are not able to uh, have all of that phytoplankton from the epilimnion and metalimnion uh, fall rain down onto them for their uh, filtration. But you can see even in the summertime, we see a dramatic decrease um, over this period when quagga mussels proliferated, um, a dramatic de decline in, in chlorophyll A. So Dave's research questions were first, has the timing and magnitude of, of phytoplankton production changed? in these two Great Lakes since 1998? And if so, to what extent can we attribute that to climate or other variables? And so the data for this talk is based on um, satellite-derived estimates of lake-wide chlorophyll A and primary production. So satellite here, here's a snapshot from May 20th, 1998. Essentially, the color of the water uh, through algorithms can estimate how productive that particular um, lake is on that given day. And so this method of using uh, satellites has been validated, um, and Dave was interested in looking at this over two different time periods. First, the pre-stratification time period, that is when we assume mussels have full access to, to the water column, and then the entire year, that is the entire ice-free portion of the year when this technique can work. Um, it doesn't work, of course, when ice per, uh, prevents you from seeing what the color of the water is. Um, 
in terms of the explanatory variables, uh, the climate variables included uh, spring air and water temperatures, uh, spring precipitation, annual air temperatures within the basin, and then annual water temperatures in the lake. Also included the effects of nutrients. Phosphorus is a limiting nutrient in these freshwater systems. So he looked at not only how much phosphorus was loaded into the system in any given year, but how much phosphorus was also measured in the offshore waters by EPA. And then lastly, uh, dracenid muscle densities uh, were included in the model. So uh, in terms of the timing, uh, the analysis was simply, does the bloom occur earlier, really in warmer years? And in terms of the magnitude, he looked at this, essentially the, um, uh, uh, took a multiple uh, linear regression approach um, and then used the Akaiki's information criterion to try to determine what model was most parsimonious, that is, uh, best explain the data without overfitting the model with all of these uh, parameters. So in terms of the timing, uh, these are the estimates, uh, the dark line, the solid line is the estimates for chlorophyll A, the dashed line is the estimate for primary production. Uh, a couple of things jump out at you. First of all, primary production, the dashed line in every year, we see that the peak in primary production is occurring after the date of stratification. So the stratification date uh, varies through time, but it's always the solid um, uh, line that sh I just showed you. Um, chlorophyll A uh, really differed between 1998 to 2001, so sort of above that red line, and 2002 and later. And, and earlier, you tended to see some peak, sometimes before, sometimes after the stratification date, but some peak in chlorophyll A, likely associated with that spring diatom bloom. But after 2002, chlorophyll gets much flatter in, in most years. You know, in some years there was a peak, but it occurred much later. So there was no evidence that um, the timing of um, the phytoplankton production was, was related to water temperature between 1998 and 2008. The magnitude is a little bit different story, however. So this is the average uh, across these two different time periods for both chlorophyll A and, and primary production. And the first model for spring chlorophyll A, um, the, the key driver was nutrients, and it was a positive effect, as you might, as you would expect a limited nutrient to be. Uh, secondly, was a negative effect of dracenid muscle densities, and no climate variables were included in this best model. Uh, the model for spring primary production, uh, the best model through the Akeiki's information criterion approach, uh, really was not meaningful from any biological sense in terms of its R squared was quite, quite low. Shifting then to uh, chlorophyll A over the entire ice-free period, um, again, a negative effect of dracenid muscle densities. And then curiously, we have a negative effect of water temperature, of, but a positive effect of air temperature. Now, Dave did do the diagnostics for collinearity, and both of these were permitted to be included within this multiple regression model. So if we think about some of the potential explanations for this, and this is speculation, uh, we can imagine a positive relationship between temperature and chlorophyll A, uh, because we know that up to a given point, carbon fixation increases with temperature, which is uh, why we saw higher primary production in the summer than in the spring. Um, another potential explanation could be that in colder years, you have later stratification, and therefore you're increasing the time in which mussels have access to the entire water column, greater access to phytoplankton, uh, and therefore you would have reductions in chlorophyll A. Alternatively, you might think about another sort of top-down response where um, an inverse relationship, as was indicated by water temperature, could be uh, the result of zooplankton grazing. Zooplankton uh, also are more productive, consume more, grow more in the warmer temperatures than in the colder, um, in colder water temperatures. So this could be an explanation for the negative relationship. For primary production, uh, again, it was a positive effect of climate, of, of air temperature, uh, and a negative effect of dracenid muscle densities. So in conclusion, in terms of the timing, um, we, there was not any evidence the spring bloom has shifted earlier in warmer years. That effect was really swamped by uh, an effect that emerged over 1998 and 2008 of dracenid muscles, and to some extent also uh, nutrients that were available. In terms of the magnitude of phytoplankton, mussels were a, con uh, a consistent 
uh, explanatory variable in, in the models, um, in three of the four models. Climate showed up for, um, for both annual magnitudes, uh, but future research is needed to try to disentangle these interacting effects of temperature and the biotic interactions uh, on the magnitude of phytoplankton production. <clears throat> So we're going to shift now to sort of mini talk number two, and that's on one on prey fish recruitment. And this was led by Paris Collingsworth, pictured here. And Paris at the time was an, uh, a postdoctoral student at, at University of Michigan. He's now moved on to Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, where he's a Great Lakes ecosystem specialist. And this work is now in press um, in transactions of the American Fishery Society. And what Paris was doing was trying to understand what, uh, to what extent climate factors regulate prey fish populations in Lakes Michigan and Huron. So uh, first of all, a little background. Why do we care about recruitment of prey fish? Well, first of all, we need, uh, we need some, number, some level of recruitment to occur over time to replenish uh, populations and, and, and fisheries. But unfortunately, that replenishment process or that recruitment is highly stochastic and has been very difficult to predict. And we know theoretically that uh, the number of fish recruits must be related to the number of mature adults and the number of eggs that are produced, but rarely, if ever, does that singular, singularly predict recruitment success with any sort of high predictability. So there's a long history in fisheries ecology and management to try to bring in other environmental predictors, biotic and abiotic, including climate, to try to improve our uh, um, predictability for uh, fisheries recruitment. Now in the, in the Great Lakes, um, we've seen uh, prey fish support of these valuable recreational fisheries that I alluded to earlier. And actually, some of the planktivorous prey fish also support their own commercial fisheries. Um, but there's been a, a strong trend over the past 20 or so years of declining prey fish recruitment and biomass in several of the Great Lakes, including the ones that Lakes Michigan and Huron that were the focus of this work. I'm calling this sort of the tale of two lakes. And so this is the time series that Paris analyzed for Lake Michigan. You can see that the bulk of the biomass is comprised of bloater and alewife, two different species. And you know, at present times, they are near record lows in terms of biomass. Now, despite the record low levels of prefish biomass, we have not seen declines in the, the fish eaters or the piscivores that eat those prefish. Uh, we've seen uh, stability in terms of Chinook salmon biomass and lake trout biomass based on model data provided out of Michigan State University. Now, contrast that with Lake Huron, where um, it does appear that we have, um, sorry, that this is the axis. This is, again, biomass on the y-axis. And, and there has been a, a general decline with the caveat that we've seen a resurgence in bloater in Lake Huron in, in the very recent years. But what I want to draw your attention to is this dark purple and light purple, and this is the alewife in Lake Huron, which was, uh, again, a consistent, uh, a large uh, part of the biomass, but then has been nearly extirpated since the early 2000s. And that and alewife has really um, remained at low level since then. So what that has meant is uh, lake trout have done fine, if not improved, with the decline of, of alewife but Chinook salmon have fared much more poorly because of that. So what we're interested in doing is trying to understand this variation in alewife and bloater using both traditional Ricker stock recruit models, uh, but also um, in cases where we found temporal autocorrelation in the time series like we did for bloater, we had to, to use uh, Bayesian uh, time varying approaches. And again, the idea was to determine what factors beyond the number of adults can we find that influence recruitment, and, and, and also, are we finding common factors between these two lakes? So uh, for alewife, then, I'm going to show you a chart like this for both species. We have the explanatory variables on the left that were fed into the model, and these are the ones that included climate variables. These are the putative mechanisms, so for example, we expected uh, long, cold winters to be negatively related to alewife recruitment based on work done in Lake Ontario showing evidence of overwinter mortality in the first year. Um, but we also looked at other factors beyond climate, such as uh, the number of salmonine predators, so salmon, and this includes the salmon and trout that I showed you earlier, 
expecting that to be negative, and lake productivity tying back into what Dave showed, or, and sort of Dave's work with the idea that the more uh, chlorophyll, the more nutrients we have, that should translate to more food for the larvae. To boil Paris's work down for alewife into one slide uh, is right here. And um, so first of all, the, the height of the bars is essentially uh, the weight of evidence for a particular explanatory variable. So um, the higher the bar, the higher the weight. And, and, and another way of thinking about it is this, like salmon, for example, was consistently found in all of the top-ranked models using AIC. And um, so salmon being in Lake Michigan by far the most important variable in explaining alewife recruitment with uh, smaller contributions from the climate variables. In Lake Huron, uh, we don't see any variable really stand out to any degree. We did see some evidence of, of lake level having a positive effect, but when you step back and look at the overall R squared of the model, um, you see a very low uh, predictability for Lake Huron alewife recruitment. When we shift to bloater, uh, there was really only one climate variable that we could include in the model. Uh, bloater is a little bit different than alewife um, in that it spends most of its time offshore in deeper waters that are, tend to be more stable and more cold consistently, uh, with the idea that being if winter and spring temperatures when the eggs are incubating are warmer, that could accelerate incubation rates and reduce bloater to egg predators. Um, other factors included other, uh, things like alewife biomass, um, the sex ratio of the population. Bloater have another strange characteristic of being skewed towards uh, females, up to 90% in some cases, and adult condition. So when you put, throw these um, into an AIC model selection approach, unlike lake, uh, unlike alewife, where we found differences between lakes, we found pretty consistent patterns between. Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. And the sex ratio, a balanced sex ratio, uh, is correlated with strong recruitment, uh, some evidence of condition uh, being positively related to bloater recruitment in both lakes and, and a negative effect of alewife. Uh, in terms of our this particular focus of our research, unfortunately, there was no evidence for any climate signal in the bloater time series. So to conclude Paris's work, uh, looking backwards, climate signals are really difficult to detect for Lake Huron and, and Michigan prayfish. Uh, alewife, the recruitment was more explained by salmon predation. Uh, Lake Huron, the, the model was just biologically unsatisfying. For bloater, recruitment in Lakes Michigan and Huron was explained by um, common factors, uh, sex ratio and alewife, but no evidence of a climate signal. And what this did within our own project was really limited our ability to forecast recruitment of alewife and bloater based on future climate scenarios, which is um, just something we were disappointed about. So what do those climate scenarios look like for our Great Lakes region um, in terms of what might we forecast for water temperature, for precipitation, uh, for ice cover? And this work was led by Brent Lofgren, and we love this slide, this picture of Brent. Uh, Bren is with NOAA, uh, Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, and essentially what he's trying to do is forecast these variables from 2043 to 2070. And typically, uh, I think ecologists are very guilty of this. We think of this as a simplistic chain of events where you have some uh, measure of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, that drives some measure of air temperature, maybe precipitation, and that in turn uh, has some ecological impact where it's this sort of one-way uh, linear relationship, where in reality it's uh, much, more comp much more complex and there are different exchanges that occur between the surface down here and up here in the atmosphere. And so what Brent has done is develop a, a, a model he calls CHARM, that essentially tries to take into account all of that complexity I just showed you on that slide before. And I'm just going to uh, show you some of the highlights here in case there are any uh, uh, physical scientists or climatologists on, uh, on the line. And what you can see here is that the results that Brent is going to be showing you are based on this particular GCM and this scenario of greenhouse gas concentrations. Now, the other thing I should note is that uh, the model does allow to take those air temperature and take the relationships and derive one-dimensional 
uh, lake column water temperatures uh, for each 40 kilometer grid scale grid cell. So uh, stepping through some of the predictions first in terms of air temperature uh, between and, and, uh, and what we're showing you is the difference between 2057 is the midpoint between 2043 and 2070 and 1985 is the midpoint between 1978 and 1993 and so in the winter you see a real north to south gradient um, no real evidence of, of anything different happening over water versus over land and we find much greater increases in winter temperatures to the north than the south. It's a little bit flipped in the summer where we find actually stronger um, or stronger or larger differences um, but here we, we do see a mod, a sort of a modulation of air temperatures over the large uh, Laurentian Great Lakes, where actually the difference is less over, over lakes than it is over land. Translating that to water temperatures then between these two time periods, uh, sort of historical in blue and yellow uh, looking out 2058 to 2070. Um, if we look at J July or June out to December, what we see is generally uh, about a two to three percent, a two to three degree Celsius increase uh, in water temperatures all the way down through the water column. Um, but a couple of other things Brent wanted to point out is in February, we actually don't actually see the lake getting all the way to four degrees C, which is what we would expect to see because the water is most dense at four degrees and at the bottom we generally get uh, as the lake cools we get four degree water um, in that hypolimnion but it's not even cold enough in the future to reach four degrees so turnover might be happening at something like six degrees instead the other interesting thing is in April um, typically we see a reverse stratification where it's the colder water on top the warmer denser four degree water on the bottom um, but in the future scenario, we actually see a, a stratification more like we see in summer, where it's the warmer water on top, colder water on the bottom. So we think about uh, the water balance, that is the difference between uh, precipitation and evapotranspiration. This has consequences for lake water levels. And you can see that over land, we expect to see a, a, a positive net balance. Over water, we expect uh, evapotranspiration to win out and have sort of a negative net water balance. And if you sum this across the entire uh, Great Lakes watershed, you actually get a small negative uh, net water balance, which, which would predict a, a small reduction in lake level. But uh, Brent's findings uh, are tend to uh, predict a, a, a smaller reduction in lake levels than some other studies have found. In terms of precipitation, uh, in the winter, so this would be snow falling. We see evidence of lake effect snow, both on the lakes and to the land to the east of the lakes. In the summer, uh, we also see more precipitation, but it's a much more patchy distribution. Uh, and in both of these, I should I should note that you're seeing mostly grays. So gray being increases um, in precipitation, whether it's winter or summer in very, very few areas like maybe down here where it's more white where you would actually see reductions in precipitation. Finally, ice thickness. Um, so here, if we look back in time, um, we see ice occurring in southern Lake Michigan. Uh, also some evidence of, of ice occurring in the deepest northern part of the lake. Uh, also in uh, deeper ice occurring in the shallower regions of Lake, of lake Michigan. Alternatively, into the future, we see uh, barely, if any, ice occurring in the south, and the only ice occurring uh, is more shallow and limited to these very uh, um, uh, shallower regions of, of the lake. So the preliminary forecasts then are for two to three uh, degrees increase in water temperature throughout the water column. Um, we also found in February that the deepest waters may actually be warmer than four degrees. In terms of precipitation, it can be characterized as wetter, whether it's winter or summer. Uh, in winter, we saw um, more snow, especially within the lake effect regions. Uh, no spatial, clear spatial pattern in summer, however. Ice cover is less in general with that north to south gradient, more ice in the north. 
Okay, so our last sort of part four of this mini talk is trying to forecast some effects of fish growth. Um, and this work was led by uh, Yu Chun Kao, who is a PhD student at University of Michigan and assisted by uh, Chuck Medenjian at USGS. And he was looking at the response of six fish species uh, in Lakes Michigan and Huron. So uh, the first question is, how does a warming climate affect fish growth? And um, certainly the direct effect would be on the fish physiology itself. Temperature affects uh, how much a fish can consume, um, but it also affects how much is lost to metabolism or how much is lost to egestion or excretion. But temperature is also going to be affecting um, other components of the food web that uh, are going to affect fish growth, such as how many prey are out there and what's the quality of those prey. So um, when we think about fish responding to a warmer environment, um, they're, you know, how are they going to do that? Well, first of all, fish are ectothermic. Um, they're un unable to regulate their body temperature um, internally, but rather take on the temperature of their environment. And so um, fish have to sort of balance choices about the temperature they occupy based on, um, I mean, all things considered, they want to stay within their physiological optimal tem temperature. That is where their biochemistry allows for uh, the greatest or the most efficient um, uh, chemical reactions to occur and, and for consumption to be highest. Uh, but they also may have to consider quality of habitat, um, such as, you know, is there enough oxygen there, for example. They also might think about you know, prey availability, or they might consider predation risk. And these are things that could keep them from occupying that optimal temperature. But as we look into the literature, we find that fish, um, there's a lot of evidence of, of um, this behavioral thermal regulation. So these are data for, for Lake Whitefish, published last, published last year from Clear Lake, Maine, showing that fish occupied um, on average, the temperature is about 13 degrees C, which is very close to their physiological optimum temperature, even when much warmer water was available, or even colder water was available, uh, potentially deeper. So the results for the sake of time we're going to show today include those for yellow perch, which is a cool water fish, and for lake trout, which is a cold water fish. Uh, from, and we're, again, building on the, the forecast that Brent provided, we're going to forecast their growth in 2043 to 2070. And we're doing this in Lakes Michigan and Huron. And uh, the assumption is that fish are going to behaviorally thermoregulate. They're going to occupy that physiological optimum temperature if it's available. But we're also going to assume different densities of prey. Um, and so we're going to allow them to essentially have high densities of prey, sort of feed ad libitum. Uh, we're going to keep them at baseline densities of prey, that is, densities of prey that they're, um, that they're experiencing now. They're allowing them to achieve growth rates in, in today's um, uh, climate, and then lower densities of prey. And effectively, what this looks like is for every, um, for every part of the lake, we have essentially a, a, a future forecast of what that water temperature is going to look like relative to baseline. And we and so here for yellow perch, which has a physiological optimum temperature of 23 degrees, you can see that it, in the future it's going to occupy, it has the potential to occupy uh, 23 degree water for a longer period. And that was what we assumed happened in the model. Same thing for lake trout. It's going to be able to occupy 8 degree water longer than it can occupy that water, than, than it can find that water uh, in, in today's uh, climate. So in terms of the methods, uh, fish growth was predicted using a bioenergetics, Wisconsin bioenergetics model, which is a mass balance approach. Um, so ultimately, we know from laboratory studies and from field validation that fish consumption is directly related to temperature. And there's a certain temperature that, that, um, that is their optimum temperature at which consumption is highest. But oftentimes, there's a realized, and that's this black, uh, black circle. But oftentimes, there's a realized consumption, or PC. Um, that is, it, uh, because fish can't always feed because of prey densities or some other reason, can't feed at optimum levels. 
So there's a realized consumption, and then um, within whatever they're able to consume, some of it goes to metabolism loss, some of it's lost to waste, digestion, excretion, and then whatever's left over can go towards growth. So all the energy is essentially accounted for in this model. So uh, briefly, there were some results that are not at all surprising. When prey avail availability was highest, we found increases in growth for both species, and concomitant with that, we found increases in consumption. And when prey availability was limited, growth was reduced. So here are what the plots look like. Uh, on your left is yellow perch. So you can see relative to baseline, when we allowed higher prey availability, we did see an increase in uh, weight of yellow perch at a given age. And again, um, it would fall below baseline when prey was more limited. On the bottom here, this just shows the amount of uh, prey fish that, or the amount of uh, prey that would be needed to allow that um, uh, allow that greater consumption, and which translates to higher growth, occur. And so, for lake trout, it's actually an even greater increase relative to baseline, and a somewhat smaller reduction during low prey densities. So you can begin to see that some species are going to fare better, potentially, say, lake trout, than, than yellow perch in, uh, in a changed climate scenario. So why might that be? And especially why might that be? Because the number of days over which um, yellow perch, over which uh, the optimal temperature is increased, actually is more days for yellow perch than it is for lake trout. So if you're just thinking about the number of days in which uh, the net number of days increase, you would predict that yellow perch growth would improve more than, than lake trout. But once Yu Chen got into the guts of the model, he found that um, one of the things that was holding yellow perch back was, first of all, they're going to have higher metabolic costs and waste costs in the future, and that left less uh, energy available for growth. The other interesting thing was that lake trout could prey upon alewife and rainbow smelt later into the fall at greater uh, rates of consumption. And because these two particular species have seasonality in their energy density or, or in the number of calories they have, and they are highest in the fall, that essentially gave lake trout more bang for their buck in terms of not only were they able to feed longer, but they were able to feed on more energy-rich prey in the fall. So again, for the sake of time, I'll just let people know that uh, Yuchan and Chuck have similar estimates for lake whitefish, for rainbow trout, and for Chinook salmon. So in conclusions, uh, unless prey resources concomitantly increase, fish growth will most likely decrease in a warming climate. So we've got to know a lot more about how many prey will be out there. And, and that just put, uh, pushes home the point of how fish respond to climate change will depend on more than just temperature. Okay, so our last slide here is just sort of overall take-home messages. And um, one thing that's clear is that climate change is in the Great Lakes region is definitely going to affect key fish habitat variables, whether it's water temperature. Um, remember, even throughout the water column, we, we saw consistently higher water temperatures even in the hypolimnion being predicted. Ice cover is going to be reduced. Uh, water levels could potentially be less than they are today, and today they're already at we saw a record low level of, of, um, for water levels in Lake Michigan earlier this spring. Uh, we recommend a mechanistic approach to try to translate these climate-driven effects into fish responses. And those mechanisms should think, obviously go beyond climate factors. Uh, to our surprise, our results revealed that non-climate factors really had an even greater impact. And we, we saw that with the effect of dreisinid mussels on phytoplankton, or the effect of salmon predation on alewife recruitment, or the importance of knowing what the prey densities were to, to the ultimate response for fish growth. Now, I, that certainly doesn't mean that forecasted climate change effects should be ignored, that we don't want to leave that um, message at all. Rather, it's just that these changes in aquatic habitat must be considered within a food web or an ecosystem context to best understand the direct and indirect effect of climate on fisheries production. So we want to acknowledge many people that have contributed data or technical assistance, and also want to acknowledge the National Climate Change Wildlife Science Center for funding this work. 
And uh, I also want to say that I'm over the question and answer period, I may kick it to our uh, co-PIs, uh, especially if your questions get uh, highly technical for certain things. And, and then this is also intended just to let you know that you can contact uh, these people uh, for more information on their uh, leadership of their specific components. So that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Bo. Very interesting presentation. And I and I like that picture at the end. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, anybody that has questions, um, there's two methods of asking your questions. First, you can text chat it in in the chat box that's located be below the participant list. And you can also use the raise hand icon that is located between the participant list and the chat box. I'll call on you by name, and then I will um, ask you to have your question ready. And then just press star six to take off the global mute, and then just ensure that the mute on your own phone is turned off as well. So that would be the same way for other co-authors to answer questions. They need to, if I kick it to them, they need to hit star six beforehand. Is that right, Ashley? Yes. Yes, okay. that's correct. Thank you. All right, do we have any questions? I see one from Holly. We already did it. Uh, can you hear, uh, Bo? Yes. Hey, hey it's Doug Beard. Thank, thanks for the presentation. I do have a question. I'm curious about the final part, and sorry, you showed sort of the species by species predictions, but you know, it seems to me that we really need to model that distribution um, like a population ecosystem model because you know, if, if Chinook go up and bloaters go down or, or et cetera, et cetera, it's all interactive. Is there any plans to, to do that? Um, because that's really going to sort of the, just the having the three different prey densities was, was interesting, but it's not going to be as informative of sort of the interactions that would actually happen between the species. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we do now have um, an ecopath ecosystem model that Mark Rogers has developed for Lake Michigan. And we've thought about ways to try to integrate climate responses or you know, try to, as you said, it's, you can't look at these things in isolation uh, because of the feedbacks that are going on. But we have not operationalized that yet. But that's a great idea. And we need to think harder about you know, how to actually run Ecosim to sort of simulate a climate effect. You know, is that happening? Um, is it going to affect the, you know, the, the production, uh, you know, the P to B ratio, for example, or you know, try to look at the guts of Ecopath, which I'm not, um, which I have not run, but try to look at the guts of that and try to figure out how can we make Ecopath work to sort of simulate the climate change effects. All right, thank you. And then, um, did Holly's group have any more questions? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing any more raised hands or anything coming in the chat box. So we I see one. Them. I see one from Gregor Sherman. Do you see that, Ashley? I don't. I think he just sent it to you. Could you go ahead and read it into the um, audio record, please? Sure. He, he says, how do you think your findings might translate to fishes and fisheries and streams and rivers? Presumably many of the same principles apply, but what is likely to be different? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a tough question for somebody that hasn't sort of worked in those systems since his master's degree. Um, but I think the same sort of process could could be in place, right? To so try to think about what are the what are the mechanistic drivers that are happening for, say, um, you know, a particular salmonid, say brook trout in you know the eastern United States. Um, and I know that a lot of people are doing work exactly on brook trout uh, and potential effects of climate change and trying to use downscaled models to, to forecast that. And um, let's see, I think Ben Letcher would be somebody that, um, if he hasn't given a, a, a seminar in this 
particular webinar series, or you know, I might invite Greg to reach out uh, to Ben, who's really thought about the effect of climate change on stream fishes, and could answer your question a lot better than me. So, kind of a lame answer, but I have another one, Ashley, that's been sent to me. Okay. Yep. Go right ahead. I don't have any. Okay. Um, this is from Donald Rivard. Apologize, I'm not getting the pronunciation right. Water levels have been historically low, as I understand. Is the predicted trend to continue downward? Um, how much of this water level drop is attributable to dredging in Lake Huron or in Lake St. Clair? So um, I'm just going to briefly answer that and kick this to our water level expert, um, Brent Lofgren, who is on the line, and just to, um, just to kind of revisit what I said. Um, is that Brent's models are forecasting a little bit lower water levels, um, but not as low as been forecasted by other modelers that have, um, have essentially used different methods to, to come up with it. Um, Brent, do you want to do you want to address Donald's question in terms of lake levels, or can people see Brent's response here on the chat? Hi, this is Brent. <clears throat> um, actually, I was busy texting sort of a response regarding the previous question while you were saying what this question is. So could you please repeat it? Sure. Donald is uh, interested in water levels. And uh, he's saying, is the predicted trend in water levels is it to continue downward? And how much of this drop is it attributable to dredging in Lake Huron or Lake St. Clair? Yeah, the... Uh the attribution to dredging in 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 uh, the St. Clair River is a controversial topic. Um, I would say it's not entirely out of the question. Um, we we also have a, a very difficult time of attributing the low lake levels, even though they've persisted over about 15 years. Um, <clears throat> We have a hard time attributing those to greenhouse gas related causes. Um, they, they, they seem to be primarily due to the climate and increased evaporation, primarily from the lakes, somewhat from the, uh, the land and the watershed as well. Uh, but yeah, we, we, have, we have not directly link those to human-caused climate change, and uh, there is definitely a large measure of natural variability involved in what we've seen over the past 15 years. Okay, thanks, Brent. Yep. And then do you have any more, Bo? Because I'm not seeing them for some reason. I do not. Okay. All righty. I'm just scanning for any more hands. All righty. I don't see any more questions. And so I'd like to thank Bo for a great, great presentation. Thank you, Bo. Okay. Thanks for the invitation, Ashley. Oh, absolutely. And um, I'd like to thank all the participants for their attendance.